Welcome back. This is lecture 18. This is the first of two parts of post-impressionism. And today we are talking about this kind of uh, period of time, uh, 1890 to about 1920. Some of the historical events that will play a role in what we look at today are up here. Uh, the first one is Tahiti becomes a French colony in 1880. And in 1880, there was a new king in Tahiti, in French Polynesia. And he didn't really care about ruling, and so he sort of handed over the government to the French governor. When we get to Gauguin, we'll discuss more about the activities of the French in Tahiti, etc. But just know for now that it became an important part of France's colonial system. The Eiffel Tower was completed in 1889, and it was constructed for the 1889 World's Fair. It took a couple years. It was initially criticized. It was called a sore thumb in the eye of the world by some of France's leading artists and intellectuals. But it has become this global cultural icon for France. It's the most recognizable structure in the world. People at the time hated the tower, but ate lunch at its restaurant every day. One of the writers, Guy de Maupassant, said, I, I eat at the tower every day because it's the only place where I don't have to see it if I'm inside of it. It was only meant to stand for about 20 years, but the French military began using it for radio communication and telecommunication. And when the, the permit expired in 1909, the city of Paris decided to keep it. And one of the interesting things about the Eiffel Tower is that the paint has a gradient to it. So it's painted darker at the top and lighter at the bottom because of atmospheric perspective. In other words, the top, because it's so far away, would look lighter uh, if it was all painted the same color. So they painted the, the top darker, and therefore it looks the same color as the bottom. And that last thing, J'accuse, in 1898, that was a famous letter written by Emile Zola about the Dreyfus affair, or the Dreyfus uh, affair. The scandal began in 1894, and there was this Jewish captain of the military who was convicted of treason because somebody found something in his garbage can, Basically, the evidence wasn't strong, but because he was Jewish, they blamed him for spying. Eventually, they found out it was somebody else that did the spying, but they still didn't drop the charges on the guy. And so Emile Zola uh, and other writers printed letters and newspapers, and they became champions for Alfred Dreyfus. At this time, there was this period of anti-Semitism in France. And so no one really defended him except for these few writers. Eventually, they had tried his case again and again, and finally in 1906, they annulled his guilty verdict. But it was this thing that sort of captured the imagination of the French public, and it showed the power of the press, and it showed just you think that you're this advanced, enlightened society, and still things like this happen. Some of the paintings we're looking at today are uh, by Seurat, Van Gogh, Cezanne. We'll look at some Gauguin, all of the big names in post-impressionism. I kept Monet and Courbet on there because Courbet was such a revolutionary that he kind of set off this whole movement. These people existed simultaneously with the Impressionists, so it wasn't like it totally followed one after another. In fact, you can see that when all these paintings were happening, Monet was painting his cathedral series. So... It, it was all happening together. This was just sort of the younger crowd that was trying new things. An art critic, Roger Fry, used the term post-impressionist to describe this group of artists whose work wasn't really unified, but shared these founding principles of impressionism, but adaptation in impressionism. So unlike the impressionists who use paint to interpret the world, the post-impressionists were interested in painting their emotional or psychological impressions of the world using bold colors and unique or experimental brushstrokes. And all of the painters are again from France, and I say mostly because we will go to Tahiti at some point in this lecture. Okay, we'll start with Seurat. This is called A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte, and despite the title, this painting is not a truthful rendering of this island. But it is what Seurat believed to be the optical reality of the Grand Jatte. The painting is like a performance of emotions. It uses angles and colors as a language to bring about emotional responses from the viewer. Now that sounds a little art history speak, but I'm going to explain how he does this in three different ways. 
First, he does this using optics. Optics was this theory of how people see. And there was this man, Chevreul, who uh, wrote a whole book about optics. And Seurat learns the effects of the density of, or thickness of paint and how the distance between colors and the location of colors and other factors moderate how paint works together for your eyes in order to sort of mix the paint yourself. So Seurat believed the art is harmony. And harmony is when opposites work together and they're influenced by different emotional states like happiness or calmness or sadness. And the opposites that he works with in this are tone. Tone is like the luminous or the light parts against the dark parts. Colors, complementary colors, according to the color wheel. We'll talk about this in a sec. Red and green are complementary, orange and blue, etc. And line. And line is when like two lines meet and they form right angles or some kind of angle. And the idea of lines meeting and being perpendicular also creates this harmonic balance. So it might be hard to actually see all these things in work. Luminous against dark, complementary colors working together, lines meeting at right angles. When you first look at this, you might not see that. But we're going to do some close-ups, and I'm going to show you how this all works together. So this painting uses the science of optics for you to help emotionally connect with it. The second thing is the subject matter itself. Now, what it looks like is some people enjoying a, a sunny afternoon near the water, but this painting is full of all these visual puns that show that this island was a popular hangout for prostitutes, of course. We can't get away from them with the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist. And soldiers, and also men to bring their fancy cocottes, which were high-paid prostitutes. Here's a visual pun. The monkey next to the woman and the man with the umbrellas or parasols, the way that the monkey is shaped is very similar to the bustle on the woman's dress. And if you were French and you knew at the time, the slang word for prostitute is monkey, which is saint -Gesse. The women that are fishing, guess what they're fishing for? Of course, customers, because they're prostitutes. And interestingly, the word for sinning or to sin is very similar to the word to fish, pêche, with some accent marks. It's different, but basically sinning and fishing are the same. And these women um, over by the water with the fishing poles, because, by the way, women didn't fish. Like, that was a, another thing, so that would have been strange. So anyway, this the subject matter is all of these people out on this island, but there's more going on than just a bunch of people hanging out on an island. Now, the last way that he um, appeals to your emotions is with the style itself. So he uses science um, and optics. He uses subject matter. And then his style, which is very particular to this, this is called pointillism, which I'm sure most of you know. But what he does is he juxtaposes small strokes of pure unblended color. And there's a stillness or a static quality that reflects the care that goes into perfectly placing every brushstroke. So this looks not dynamic. I mean, this is the opposite of Velasquez with the spinning wheel. I mean, everything looks, you know, very still. And he rejects the frenetic energy of the Impressionists and their nonchalant brushstrokes. It's like he's almost correcting them because they were like too thoughtless in the way they placed their paint on the canvas. So I started off with optics, and I want to go a little deeper because I want you to know that Sunday afternoon embraces these two ideas, which I'm about to share. So the first one is Chevreul, who's that guy who wrote the book on optics, along with other people, by the way. He wasn't the only one. But he's linked to what's sometimes called Chevreul's illusion, and that means that the bright edges that seem to exist between adjacent strips of identical color have different intensities. If you look at the, the um, thing on the right with the blues, and if you look at where, it's, where it says it appears darker and then where it appears lighter, it is the same exact color. It doesn't do anything. But it's just that if you place it near a lighter color or a darker color, it's going to have this sort of illusionistic effect. The other thing is that there's a halo that exists. After you look at a color, the opposite or complementary color uh, looks like it, uh, it shows up. Uh, for example, after you look at a red object, you might see a cyan or kind of a bluish um, echo or halo of the original object. 
it's like when you're watching TV and you close your eyes and then you see like the negative of the the light. It's like that, but with color. So this is due to retinal persistence, is what it's called. So the painting, Sunday Afternoon, embraces these two ideas. He uses only 11 colors in the whole painting, but he uses three different values of each color as well. You can see that Seurat knows about these things because he tries to almost artificially create these effects. I mean, look at the yellow around that woman's hat. It looks different from the ground or the background that it's next to. And if you notice how the frame works around the objects in the paintings, it uses complementary colors next to objects in the painting. For example, that green plant, there's more red in the frame than if you just look a little bit above or a little bit below. There's like more blue. So the frame that goes around it is playing off of this idea of complementary colors. And if you look at the man up close, uh, the one lying right in front of us, you can actually see how the brush strokes follow his form. They go the same angle as his shirt, but then they're going down his arm and then they turn to the left when his arm is on the ground. So, or even in the woman's hat, you can see how it sort of swirls around. This last close-up is of the fisherwoman, and that's her skirt. And you can see how the blue and pinks are next to each other, but not mixed together. And Seurat, because of his studies of optical theory, knows that your eyeballs and your brain are going to do the work. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to mix these things together. You're going to do that yourself because that's what your eyes do. They're, they find patterns. They send those signals up to your brain. You're going to do this all on your own. And this is all to say that he was like the Impressionists or the Realists and that he was painting sort of a modern contemporary thing, but he was trying to use science in order to tell a deeper truth about ourselves. Okay, uh, you might not have known about William Hogarth before this class, but I'm sure everybody knew Van Gogh. Van Gogh, Van Gogh, there's a lot of different ways to pronounce his name. He's one of the most famous post-impressionists, probably one of the most famous painters in the world. He was a socialist. He believed that modern life alienated people from both one another and themselves. His contributions to the art world would lead to the emergence of expressionism, which we'll talk about later. That's art that exaggerates aspects of form to evoke subjective emotion. In, in other words, like it really plays on your emotions by exaggerating or caricaturing something. He adapted Seurat's technique of allowing your eyes to mix the paint. I mean, you can see this in his beard there. But he painted in free, multi-directional impasto lines, as opposed to that very static dot thing or those very small lines that Seurat was doing. Van Gogh said, all of my work is based to some extent on Japanese art. Now, we have already talked about this in our Impressionist lecture about Japonisma and how everyone was nuts about it. Well, Van Gogh was no different. He was prone to bouts of depression, and something about Japanese prints made him feel better. He discovered them when he lived in Paris with his brother. The style of the prints was highly influential on his work. Japanese artists left the middle ground of their compositions empty, while objects in the foreground were sometimes enlarged. They regularly excluded the horizon. We talked about this with Impressionism. Or cut off the elements of the picture at the edge, like photography. He liked the kind of unusual spatial effects and the large areas of bold color, the everyday objects, and the attention to the details from nature. You'll see this. I mean, he did his own copy of this painting, so you can see that he was really into this idea. From Japanese prints, he also learned to forego the illusion of depth, emphasizing the flatness of the surface of the canvas. We saw this with Mary Cassatt as well. You focus on the flatness of the canvas. But he combined this idea of flatness with these swirling brush strokes, and he created a new kind of dynamic energy. We'll end this first part on this um, Van Gogh painting, which is probably his most famous, The Starry Night. And Van Gogh, like Gauguin, who we'll talk about in the next part, believed that artists should move to more primitive regions in order to find more vibrant colors. And this would help them take art to a new stage. It was the idea that, that caused him to move to the south of France in Arles. While he was there, he wanted to create an artist community. But in the end, only Gauguin came, and only for a couple months anyway. He painted from his imagination. 
Gauguin, and he encouraged Vincent to work in a more stylized way too. So Gauguin came, and his impact was great, even though he was only there for a few months. And he finally told Vincent, like, a painting isn't supposed to be a photograph, so paint what you feel as opposed to what you see. And this is one of the biggest parts of photography, which is you didn't have to paint what you saw anymore. You could paint what you felt. The Starry Night explores this contemplation of life and death with a psychological and energetic intensity. And I have a few videos for The Starry Night because I want you to see them and see it in different ways. So I will end this lecture by saying, please watch those videos because they're fascinating. One is about how Van Gogh might have actually been able to sense the flow of energy in the universe through mathematics. It's fascinating. Okay, until next time.